Even if it's gray outside, it's hailing, it's raining, let's freaking get after it, baby. <laughs> it's snowing, it sucks outside, it's winter, let's freaking go. Get, it's, it's thunderstorming outside, there's lightning, hit me with it, come on! Like, All right, so my first question is, Fighter, how are you doing today? Fantastic. Every day I get to wake up, take another breath, put my feet on the ground, scream, let's go. That's a, that's a great day to me. So Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I thought you were going to say. For those who are (laughs) listening for the first time, Fighter is one of the most energetic people I've ever had the pleasure of talking to, so this is going to be a good one. You've made some really serious improvements to your life over the past few years. Apparently, you lost a lot of weight. Can you say how much weight you lost? Yeah, so I was about uh, 185 uh, on like a a 5'6", 5'7", if you're asking me, frame. (laughs) And uh, now I'm walking around at like 145, 146 on a given day. But before I got up to here, I got, I started lifting, word to ox. I got down to like 130. Wow. I started putting weight on. I got a hip surgery when I was wrestling in college and uh, it, it ended my, my wrestling career prematurely. Mm. And uh, I had gone at this point, it's like 12 years or something like that with cutting weight and not being able to eat anything like ever 20 pounds in three weeks, you know, just ridiculous stints of weight. I, I just decided to eat <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's like, for like four months. The cutting weight thing is crazy. My brother was on crew, so he was a rower in college, and they wanted to have a lightweight boat. And my brother is 6'3", and he had to get down to 165. Like, it was it was insanity, and he was so skinny, um, and he was so tired. Did you feel that way when you were wrestling, when you were not eating a lot? Um, I would feel that way during practice. I always had to cut a lot of weight. Like, in high school, like, I wrestled 101 my sophomore year. And was cut down from like 115. So that's not like extreme, but to make that like every week, sometimes twice in a week, it's tough. Would you do it right before you would wrestle? So like that's what my brother would do. He would try to cut like the two days beforehand. He wouldn't eat anything. He would just try to flush it all out of his system and make weight. And then he would eat a ton right before he actually rode. Yeah, that's... uh that's exactly how I would do it. (laughs) I didn't learn until recently how irresponsible uh, that is and how much uh, more difficult it makes it to actually perform at a a good level when you do it like that. It put him back in terms of weightlifting years almost. Yeah. I mean, cutting weight has a it has serious effects on the body. Long-term effects too. For a long time, my intestines were just like wrecked. Yeah. From I would not eat, or I would eat as little as humanly possible, drink as little as humanly possible, you know, to the point where like I'm I'm spitting to like I'm like I'm spitting like ounces out to get that last little bit off, and just then binge eating after <laughs> after <laughs> a wedding, you know. I mean, so it, it would it would be uncommon to gain like six to ten pounds that day. Oh my god, that's crazy. It's ridiculous. How did you get involved in wrestling to begin with? By the grace of God, <laughs> I I was in sixth grade, and uh, our wrestling program has an incredible. Yeah, you know he's retired now, but an incredible coach. In sixth grade, he came and did like a, a a phys ed unit where he he put out one big old wrestling mat and <laughs> was just showing these you know sixth grade you know fifth sixth seventh graders just the very basics of wrestling. And um, you know at this time sixth grade I'm maybe four foot like three and <laughs> grand total max 60 pounds and uh I loved it I loved wrestling and uh, I took a flyer home that night to my mom and said uh hey I want to do this uh, I want to sign up for the youth program can you put me in it please and she was like what <laughs> club tidy and uh, <laughs> like I was like please uh, I'd like to wrestle it was over it was over from there <laughs> What did you love most about the sport? And you still do it to an extent today, but now beach wrestling. Facts. Beach wrestling and and, and no gi jujitsu, but what you learn from it, what you learn from wrestling, and this is this is the case for all sports. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter, regard, regardless what sport you're playing, across all sport, there are universal lessons that you can learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am admittedly very biased, and I would say that, wrestling teaches them a little bit harder because you have added factors like cutting weight 
wrestling practices and wrestling training is brutal. <laughs> it's miserable. So it's it's one of those things where it's like if you want to be really successful in it, you you have to kind of love wrestling. Um, so I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned and just you know anybody in general starting to become a rise in like uh adult wrestling like yeah. uh just like straight up non-wrestlers learning how to wrestle as adults like just for like self-defense and stuff like that like outside of jiu-jitsu you learn how to be disciplined you learn how to get better by having to do more than everybody else wrestling like, in terms of martial arts i always t- said it was like fighting without getting to actually punch somebody <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I think part of the reason why adults are getting more involved in martial arts and wrestling is maybe because of the rise of MMA. So like I have started watching MMA because of Joe Rogan and because of the jungle, basically. And I was not their demographic five years ago, let's say. So it's so much more popular now. And it's fascinating to watch which type of martial art is most lethal in the octagon? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to say wrestling. Yeah. Uh, in terms of not striking. Uh, it, but, you know, I mean, if, if you have striking and you are, you also have solid, solid wrestling, you're a problem. It's, you know, you can, you can throw hands, you can throw legs, you can throw feet, and you can also get to, get to people's legs. You can put them down, you can take them down, you can keep them on the canvas. That's difficult to get away from. But in terms of striking, I really enjoy kickboxing. I don't enjoy doing it very much because <laughs> my hip surgery. But m- most lethal, I-, I would say, is probably kickboxing. It's very, it's solid. Just a quick clarification question. What is the difference between wrestling and jujitsu? Is a wrestler going to get worked in a jujitsu gym or is he going to be able to hold his own? So it, it depends on the-, the level of wrestler you were, but or are but if you have a general baseline of wrestling it's very applicable to jiu-jitsu especially to nogi jiu-jitsu that's an important clarification to make there's two two different forms of of jiu-jitsu here there's there's gi and there's no gi i admittedly hate the gi because of being a wrestler i don't like the, the thing is with the gi is that you you have lapels you have sleeves you have pants and a oh. belt that you wear that you're allowed to grab and utilize to uh, get yourself into advantageous positions. In no gi, you wear a compression shirt and compression shorts or fight shorts, and you're not allowed to grab onto those. In gi, wrestling is very applicable because you're still grappling. You know, you're still starting on your feet. Somebody has somebody's going to get taken down, get put, you know, put to their back, you know, or their hips are going to get pinned down to the mat. But the difference is, is that you can use, you can utilize those grips. You know, you can grab onto their clothes to help defend and to help get to your own attacks. So, you know, wrestling is very effective in it. And uh, in no gi, wrestling is even more effective, in my opinion, because there's no there's no clothes to grab. You know, my first time ever competing in jujitsu, I, I, I competed in gi and no gi. And <laughs> I got so mad because I was waxing these dudes on my feet but there was like this one guy who was just like and he wasn't he wasn't even like nice at like wrestling like I ended up submitting him he just kept stopping my attacks by grabbing my like my collar grabbing Mm -hmm. my sleeve I was like I can't do this man (laughs) I gotta go doki only I can't Uh, but that makes a lot of sense and then is Brazilian jiu-jitsu a specific one or is it both types that's a great question Brazilian jiu-jitsu I believe is its own separate thing but I could not tell you the difference. A lot of martial artists, you know, they they want to study everything that they possibly can, figure out all the different ways that go through all the scenarios, and they like to be prepared for all of that. I don't, <laughs> I don't at all. If I know what I'm good at, that's what I'm good at. Why why put my eggs in a million different baskets when I can just like I can put them you have have large baskets, I guess you could say. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Totally. So you would totally recommend um, martial arts, jiu-jitsu, wrestling as a youth sport for any kid? Um, yes. Yes, with a caveat. I'm not a big fan of striking for, for children. Yeah. Uh, I just don't really think that there's a, a reason or a necessity for a child to really be learning how to, like, like within reason. I mean, like, you know, you get to like 13, 14, whatever, that's a little bit different. But like, you know, a young kid, I don't really think that there's a reason for uh, that youngin to be 
having to <laughs> throw hands and get hands thrown <laughs> at him. But I think that a grappling based martial art, judo, uh, wrestling, jujitsu, is fantastic for young athletes because man is going to turn you into it's going to it's going to make you tough the lessons learned from it and the mindset forged from it allowed me to pick myself back up and get my feet back to move in yeah and make progress yeah i actually was in the boxing club in college one year i just wanted to try it um but it was really fun yeah, it's it is fun. That's another reason why I think it's great for, for the youth athletes. If they have a a good coach, a coach that is more so prioritizes the wrestlers having fun and and learning to enjoy wrestling and enjoy the process, that's that's a pretty big deal. And uh cuz it's a tough sport and co- coaches that do that build very dynamic athletes. You can ask them a little ask a little bit more of them. But it's it's also just fun because because man it's just like you're just moving your body that's fun I, I, lifting is fun but like there's something a little bit more primal about you're down on the ground and you're doing you know the push ups the you know clap push ups you know box jumps you know you're just doing like animal stuff it feels like no I actually totally agree with that and your point about the impact of really good coaches um, the biggest thing I would say is that I had some tough coaches and it really thickens your skin. I think that's kind of an important thing, especially for young girls, because people tend to treat you with kid gloves. Like you can't take criticism as a 14 year old girl, but then you're on a soccer field and you have a really tough coach and it molds you a little bit to say criticism isn't a personal attack. They're trying to make you better and you have to have that thick skin through life. And I think in a lot of cases, women don't get that growing up if they're not involved in sports. Mm, I can see that. The the thing is with coaches is that for their athletes, they get a larger than life status. Mm. If they're having the proper impact, they get this sort of larger than life status where they have an ability to impact that athlete on a level that nobody else can mm. because they see different sides of that athlete than parents see. That coach has, has a, a great ability to impact the athlete in a way that other people don't get to their skills that just they they hit different (laughs) they hit different you know when you're an athlete as you know you were saying you were you know soccer uh you get to you 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 get a little bit of a chip on your shoulder and you know some for some it's a bad thing but for a lot of athletes it 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 gives them a little bit of self-confidence that they might have not had prior to that it's very empowering to know that you're you're putting you're putting in work and you know whether you're really seeing results or not you're like in terms of like winning you know mm-hmm. you're still leveling up and you're still getting after it and that does that does something to your psyche yeah i agree and also just being a part of a team it's something i miss now just the jabs at each other on the bus and all that kind of stuff you can't get that in the civilian world as an adult if you're not in the military you're not on a team anymore like I really really miss it yeah that that camaraderie aspect of it man it's it's beautiful I I, I'm a weirdo but I was a serious weirdo in high school my turbo thing is wrestling if if I start talking about wrestling that's why I gotta be careful here because (laughs) if if I get to going (laughs) I might start doing technique. I might start. I might start shadow wrestling while we're talking over here. So being on a team, I I had forty guys, fifty guys that to an extent kind of had to be my friend. I, so I didn't have very many many friends in high school because I was a weirdo. And when I got to college, I went to a very big university, and I was a little worried. About like, dang, meeting people is going to be weird. Like. These people don't want to talk about wrestling. <laughs> uh, they just want to talk about wrong. At college, it was more serious. Like we, we were a lot more interconnected in each other's lives. The the team aspect is a lot more serious in college because in college it's like a job. Mm-hmm. When you're an athlete in college, you are you are working a job for the university essentially. Yeah. <laughs> we had to we had to be friends with each other because we spent at least at least three fifths of the day together. 
so you know you have all these people that like and, and from very diverse backgrounds because these colleges recruit from all over the country yeah it was uh it was cool it, it that that camaraderie aspect of, of being on a team uh and getting exposed to different people it helps you grow very extensively as a person i would agree so give me your rundown of what is mindset why does it matter how can you create or cultivate the best mindset the the thing is with mindset is that much like health mindset is never ending there is no final destination the way to build the best mindset is by finding people that you admire their mindset and taking things from that watching a video you know whatever it might may be experience doing a lot a lot of different things, expecting a lot out of yourself, expecting a lot of like putting yourself into uncomfortable situation. A lot of wrestlers are, are very hard nosed and tough and, and gritty. And, and because, you know, I mean, wrestling is a legalized fight. So for me, a lot of what mindset is to me is, is being resilient and learning how to be resilient because that's not just something that everybody has. A lot of people are softer than baby shit, respectfully. How can you tell if you're softer than baby shit? Do you whine a lot? <laughs> um, do you mouth breathe? You're probably soft to the baby shit. <laughs> when it's gray outside, do you only see it for a gray day or do you see it as still a, a very nice day? It's beautiful. You know, thank you, God. Are you scared of the rain? Do you need an umbrella <laughs> <laughs> for a light drizzle? Do you I just, I asked the question because I think a lot of people think they're hard, like they're tough guys and I'm not convinced. Absolutely. Especially with the advent of the freaking internet. It's, it's become it's become so much worse since social media became a thing. Because now people can just, they can say whatever they want. <laughs> they don't need to back it up. They don't need any proof. Exactly. They can say anything they want to whoever they want to say it to. And 95% of the time, you don't have to worry about any repercussions. Unless you of- try to talk to Bowtie Ox and he shames you in front of his 50,000 000- Twitter followers. <laughs> that's that's the only as, time as there's any do. backlash. That's that's that, that's retribution. They need to... <laughs> I like um his point of view that if you're not jacked, you shouldn't be able to run for office. I think that's a very fair point of view. You don't have the discipline to go to the gym and watch what you eat. Why are you telling me how to run my life? Hundred percent. First off, anybody that like if you want to be taken seriously and you, and you're not in good health you're not a serious person no totally (laughs) like I can't take you seriously if you can't take yourself seriously enough to eat real food at at the very least go for freaking walks do some freaking push-ups at home or something like it's not stupidly difficult to maintain and achieve baseline but you're in a position of authority you're uh, you're somebody that people look to for leadership you, you look like a scooby-doo i don't i don't really know uh like how great your ability to lead in an optimal way that's like actually beneficial for people yeah i mean especially if you're rich like someone like bill gates who looks like as they say a melted fudge sickle that there's no excuse for that when you have you can have someone make your own food for you you can have someone decide what your workout is and plan it in your schedule like I understand you're a very busy guy doing whatever Bill Gates does but I think he has time to go lift some weights same thing with like Ben Shapiro skinny fat like our leaders who do we have to look up to that's jacked only anonymous cartoons 100% Oxford president baby (laughs) Oxford president we'll start his campaign isn't that a crazy thought that you could there's no way you could have an anonymous person be president but you could get a lot of support for an anonymous person to be president. <laughs> Definitely. And that's that's social media, man. It's like Batman, but president. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's a really good point. Like social media has made people softer in that they can say things with no backing, no evidence, no proof of their own success. And it makes you think that you can just throw darts at people or throw tomatoes when you have done nothing on your own. I, that's something I get concerned about with like what I'm doing. Like I'm pretty young making these political statements. But one of the reasons why I started my channel is because I kept watching other 
people talking about politics and I was like, okay, if they're allowed to talk about this with their level of understanding, I'll, I'll take a second here to say what I think too, but I don't want to come across as if I know everything because I don't, but I can't ask questions. And it's just looking at some of the things that people say, like, okay, if this person has a platform, I can have a platform too. <laughs> Yeah, one hundred percent. You know, to be honest, I think you do a you do a great job of finding that balance in your your content and the way you present your content of of, of not coming across like uh, you know like like you know everything or anything like that That's as a young awesome person. To hear. <laughs> That's part of the reason why I'm starting the podcast because I don't know anything about wrestling or jujitsu. I don't know anything about survival, but I can ask good questions. So I think that's an area that a young person can add value. So what do you think the solution is for these social media trolls who are just plaguing society with their softness? You know, the classic, go outside, touch some grass. You know? <laughs> but really, if, if you're somebody who is like, you're, you're chronically like maliciously trolling people online, there's reasons in your life why you do that. You don't really have anything better to do with your life first off, but you also like don't really even have like like love for your yourself, you know, or like any like even appreciation for yourself. Totally. And it seems like something that would have been mitigated had they been put in wrestling as a sixth grader. You know, it's something that really would have helped them if they were pushing themselves and succeeding by pure effort alone and getting pushed by coaches they admire a lot of that gets ironed out bars. I a hundred percent agree with you. You know, when, when, when you're wrestling, you, you, you're getting punched in the side of the head. Yeah. You're, you're getting your, your arms bent into weird positions. Your back is taking damage because you're getting your head pulled down, your arms pulled down. A lot, a lot of things in, in wrestling that like chip away at your, your psyche a little bit and your, uh, your resiliency and, and uh, end up making you much tougher as long as you're not a baby, there's a lot of soft ass wrestlers too. You know, you complain during practice and, and, or, uh, you know, coach asks you to do an extra sprint and you, you nearly freaking cry. I think wrestling too, even more than other sports, any of those martial arts, it's mono e mono. Like you're one v one another guy. Like there's some primal aspect to it that hardens you as a man, I think, in a way that like tennis doesn't. I mean, tennis is a great sport. I love tennis, but it's different. <laughs> yeah, no facts. I think wrestling gave me like a uh, a sense of like, you know, that mono e mono aspect. Like, all right, I, I get to win or I get to lose based on how I utilize myself and the work that I've done off this competition mat. And I don't have anybody but myself to rely on. And that's why mm. wrestling wrestling became so beneficial to me because of the fact that it was while it's a team sport it's an individual sport if you go half-ass in practice you're, you're a half-ass wrestler and if you go hard in practice and you push everybody to the very brink and <laughs> you beat up everybody and then you go to another practice and you get even harder practices in with other people and like you, you do more than everybody and sheesh it makes you powerful man if you, you can be self-motivated What's your take on hazing? Because in my opinion, and I don't mean like fraternity hazing where they make you drink a lot until you almost kill yourself. I mean, hazing amongst the team, because I was an advocate for hazing. When I was a freshman in high school, the the seniors on the team, because I was on varsity, no big, but they were, they roasted the crap out of me every single day. I knew walking into practice that I was going to get wrecked. I was going to get shoved. I was going to be the person taking the cones and the stuff back to the shed. Like I was just going to get the shit. And it, I loved it because I was like, they were picking on me. Like it made me feel so special. And then <laughs> when I became the senior, I wanted to push that back down because it tightens the team. And by the time I was a senior, it was no longer socially acceptable to be mean to the freshmen. Like the one team, now we all do the cones. I was like, I did the cones for a freaking year on my own. And now I have to do it again as a senior. Like seniority matters. So what's your take on hazing? Yeah, that's uh. so when I got to college, man, fr frick hazing. <laughs> that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> but I think hazing is a good thing if done the right way. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, the hazing was not done the right way. Uh, 
like dudes would get put on boxing gloves and beat the piss out of somebody in the in a bathroom. <laughs> like not beat the piss, but just like, you know, start boxing this dude. I think I got like a match burned on me. That was mine. Oh um, my gosh. Just like it, it I got I got, it barely got tapped on me. It, it, <laughs> no big deal. For me, I think that hazing's a form of accountability. If you're getting hazed, it's because the person doing it, if it's being done properly, the person doing it is doing it out of a place of caring. And the way I would approach it is just like I would do it in the practice room. Like I would <laughs> I would just beat the piss out of people in practice and you know I would push them hard I would put it was it was common in high school for me too uh because you know while I was from a very big athletic school my wrestling team was was not so good you know a lot of the guys didn't really take wrestling so seriously by the time I got good I didn't get good at wrestling until 10th grade I was actually absolute garbage trash (laughs) basura before that the way I would do it is just like man, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to break you in the practice room. And if you get broken, all right, well, tomorrow I'm going to do it again. Oh, you want to pick a different partner? Nope. Sorry, buddy. Your partner's with me. (laughs) (laughs) I would regularly just have to switch partners mid practice. Like guys would just be like, I'm, I'm, I don't want to go with this guy anymore. I'm I'm not, I'm going to (laughs) leave. So I'll just go out and be like, all right, get out of here then. I'll go grab some Weakling. <laughs> I would always come back home. Because I, revel- I reveled in it in high school. I would come back home and like tell my mom. And like, you know, I'm, I'm like puffing my chest up. And <laughs> she, she's like, why are you being so mean? Because <laughs> like, they need to know. They need to get with it or get out of the freaking wrestling room. No, I totally agree. We would do 1v1s. And like, if you beat someone over and over and over again, you have to let them know. Like, <laughs> the smack talk is a necessary part. And then if you get beat that one time, they're going to light you up. But it's it's worth it. And it makes everybody better. It makes the whole team better. You have to be able to take that kind of thing. But then also like that that team dynamic, you know, it, it does bring, you know, when done properly, that is always a very, very Yes, important. with asterisks, when done properly. Very important distinction. Because there's a lot of hazing that's done very, very wrongly. When, when done properly, like it does build a certain team chemistry. Yeah, I was talking to one of my old coaches when I went home like last year and he was like, it's the kids are different now since basically when your class left, like they don't care as much. They're not as driven as a team together. They're more concerned with being like socially perceived as nice or whatever. (laughs) They don't have the heart that older athletes used to have that he saw at our high school. And he's like, they're just annoying. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't respect the coach as much. Like, if you don't have the hazing from the seniors to be like, hey, be respectful, to listen when people are talking and they're just chatterboxing or something like that. Like, all those things add up and it really wears on a team when, yeah, it's a bunch of 15-year-old girls, but it still matters. Like, you should still put effort into it, even if, just whatever. It's just, it should matter. Every time you step out of the house, what you do should matter. That Bars. Like, everything you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Wh- what you do matters. How yeah. you do thing is how you do everything. Yeah. It's important to put that best foot forward. And and that's always, it's, it's, it's not like a, a sometimes thing. It's, it's as often as I humanly can. And it never hurts for people to learn how to respect those who deserve respect a little bit better. Yeah. That's, that's huge. Uh, especially for, for young, young people, because learning to interact and respect with people that are like, an authority figure of sorts like an authority <laughs> figure who's hard on you but it's only for your best interest yes in mind yes there are so few people that can fill that gap in your life throughout your life someone who is trying to make you better solely for your own sake yeah mentors yes yeah so few people and when you're 15 maybe you don't real recognize that you should be respecting that person a lot for the time that they're investing in you facts that's what i'm looking for right now is you know as as an athlete right now i'm i'm in a, a phase where i'm figuring out i'm i'm getting ready to move mm. somewhere and i'm figuring out where i'm going to go based off of like what training opportunities i have what coaches yeah. i have access to and and you know where where can i utilize my connections as a division 1 wrestler and you know with my coaches and stuff like that to get me into a good spot so that I can start really getting after this beach wrestling the way I want to get after this beach wrestling. 
Yeah. And I'm just, but you saying this, like I'm looking for new coaches and I'm trying to move to the next place to get involved in the sport that I love. Like the average 30 year old man, 25 year old man doesn't have that anymore. Like maybe they play in a rec league after work, but there's no reason why the athleticism has to end. Like the pushing yourself once you graduate from college at 22. Excellent. You know, and like the average person is missing that. Like I'm missing that right now because I do the rec leagues, but I don't feel like I'm being pushed at all. But I think those gyms and the martial arts, especially, they have created this new community and this new ability for people to really push themselves again in a way that they haven't. Like, yeah, you can go to the gym and squat and keep pushing yourself that way. But against someone else in a competitive manner, that's a new thing for guys that I think is really awesome. It's empowering. It's uh, it's great for for men like i'm always gonna have to compete in something like at a high like a highlight like after after i'm done with wrestling like i don't know uh let's rock climb <laughs> like so it's, let's let's go learn how to competitive like see like like ocean fish deep ocean fish or some you know uh free diving you know something that i can still compete with other people to be the best in something that's that's important to me I totally agree. And I think it's, I don't know where we lost it. You know, maybe it was the participation trophy generation that made us lose it. Maybe it's sitting in a nine to five desk job. I think that's part of life is the contest. Life's a fight. Have you heard? Life is definitely a fight. I have read that somewhere before yeah. and experienced that myself. It's uh, <clears throat> yeah, you're always going to get something thrown at you and uh you gotta learn how to roll with it and 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 not be softer than baby shit fight back mm-hmm. you know you can you can live your life and be a, a victim to your circumstances and just a, a little baby and just like and eh, i don't want to do this and eh, it's so hard and everything sucks and it's gray outside my cup is half full shut the hell up how dare you disrespect god's green earth with your weakness exactly it's- you said it better than i could ever but how does the mindfulness component factor into this this competitiveness? Like, how can, is, does mindfulness make you better in the contest of life, and how so? Absolutely, we are a culture of people, uh, as an like an overall society that lives very mindlessly. We spend a lot of our time staring into screens on social media, on Netflix, on for these degenerates Pornhub. Uh, you know, these, these, these different avenues, you know, we spend a lot of time sedentary. We spend a lot of time just not being here, here present in this current moment going on right now, hearing the, the, the things that there are to hear, feeling your feet touching the ground, being able to be conscious of the inhale that you're about to take, just really experiencing this moment. So in the, the competition of life, I think that if you can if you can live in the present moment, that's some good currency right there. The ability to actually be here, to separate yourself from the things that are constantly taking you out of the present moment. This is a great moment right now. Like, I'm here. I'm alive. Like, let's go. I don't know how you can have a bad day when you have that mindset. Like, God, I'm alive. Let's do something fun today. Like, let's go push ourselves today. Exactly. I walk out the house every morning at the sunrise. And I, the first thing I do is I walk into the, I walk into the street, I look up into the sky and I literally yell, thank you, God, I'm here. I get what I get another freaking day. Mm-hmm. What a blast. I, there's nothing better that I could be offered. No better blessing that I could ever receive. Wake up and just be here and, and get to get to challenge myself, get to do things and, and, and learn things and, and try to challenge my perspective and and challenge myself on an intellectual level and a physical level and a a spiritual level disciplinary level like i'm I'm fired up to be here like even if it's gray outside it's hailing it's raining let's freaking get after it baby (laughs) it's snowing it sucks outside it's winter let's freaking go It's, it's thunderstorming outside there's lightning hit me with it come on like there's so much to be fired up about look at that freaking squirrel that just crossed the street that's beautiful. I think I know I'm going to start the podcast. I think I know what clip is going to go for. <laughs> Men need to do more jujitsu. Yeah. <laughs> Simple. There's something that something changes in a man once 
he learns to and realizes that he can take care of himself in a physical sense. So true. Once you recognize that and you, you have acquired a level of, of skill that you know in a, in a need to setting, you can you can take care of yourself. That's you're not the same guy no more after that. The self defense aspect of it. Here's a question. Is it useful for a woman to learn jujitsu or does it install within her a false sense of confidence? Because that's the the backlash I've seen on Twitter that some girl goes and starts taking jujitsu and suddenly she thinks she can fight anybody on the street when really the best case scenario for a woman is to just not be out late at night, run, use your phone, like that type of thing. I think that the important thing, and, and this is something that applies to men and women because a lot of people, you know, start doing martial arts and get an overinflated sense of themselves. Like, I'm that dude. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> come, I'm a dog when you're not a dog yet. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, and uh, for women, it's, it's something where absolutely they should be learning it. I, I see no downside for them to be learning it. It's great physical exercise for them. It builds skills that they otherwise would not be building. It does give them a sense of of self-confidence and empowerment that, you know, they could take care of themselves a little bit. But I think that knowing yourself and being being rational headed, like level headed enough to like recognize like when you need to run and when you need to scrap. And 99.5% of the times man or woman, like don't scrap. <laughs> like yeah. unless you have to, like unless you have to. You absolutely have to. Don't. There's no reason. Just, just get out of there. Just, just turn around and run. Honest, honest, on, yeah, honestly, you know, turn around and run. Mm-hmm. Put the pride down for a second and uh, keep your life. Yeah. Because you never know what somebody's got on them. Yeah. Being comfortable in your body and like knowing what you're capable of is a really powerful feeling that I think a lot of people don't have anymore mainly because their body isn't capable of much. You're making me want to sign up for the Muay Thai gym, like a couple blocks down from me. But <laughs> you should. You should. I'll, I'll live tweet about it. It'd be a good series. You absolutely should. <laughs> Fully yours. I have a feeling I'd be yeah. like, stop focusing on my nine to five and I would just go every single day. There's a timeline where you now go sign up for Muay Thai and you end up becoming a UFC champ. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the parallel dimensions. I'm not going to lie. Is. It is. And I would have to tell my dad about it and he'd fly in every time I would roll with somebody because he has to see it. Once a soccer dad, always a soccer dad. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, it's interesting that, uh, so did, did your dad play soccer? No, just he was like just tangent? far too invested in my childhood soccer career is how I would describe uh, it. <laughs> ah, okay. That's, that, I, that's an interesting concept to me. Uh, parents of athletes. And wrestling, a lot of people, a lot of parents take it way too seriously, especially mm-hmm. at a youth level. And they kill it. The, a sport that's as difficult as wrestling is, they just kill it for yeah. the athlete because they just don't do it right. Like they're very hard on their at, like their child. Like you know, they're not very kind about it. Like there's a lot of like it, it is a trope in wrestling. Like the the wrestling dad. Like you go to any youth tournament, you go to any high school tournament. And you're going to see just psychotic wrestling dads on the side of the freaking mat, mat side. Oh my while gosh. there's sons out there screaming, you know, oh being yeah. louder than the freaking coach. It warps wrestling for a lot of, a lot of youngins. Oh, I, I could not agree more on this. Um, I love my dad dearly. We're very, very close, but he was a soccer dad to this extreme on the sideline. And it took me getting on to like a really good team where the coach threatened to bench any kid whose parents said anything on the sideline. So if your your parents said anything during the game loudly, the kid was benched for the rest of the game. And so that's how my dad got in check. Basically, I have a real problem with the pressure put on kids in youth sports You don't need to go to the Olympics for it to be meaningful in your life. Something that really bothered me growing up was like, I was on this team and my coach wanted me to go play soccer at college because he wanted to have it on the website that he had another commit, you know, so it was good for his business. It's become such a business, all these youth sports. Oh, that's unfortunate. I was in a position where I was actually a better student than I was a soccer player. And so anywhere I would have played soccer would have been worse than a school I could have gotten into 
And then people say, why didn't you play at an Ivy League? Well, if I played at an Ivy League, I would be $300,000 in debt because they don't give any sports no scholarships. Way. No athletic money. Well, now, now with the NIL deals. That's true. That's Ooh, true. Geez. I could have sold my mug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he that, was man. more focused on getting another name on the website than what was best for me. And it really pushed me out of the sport. Like my junior and senior year of high school, I was like, I know this isn't what's best for me. Like, I'm not going to play pro soccer. I'm not the top, top level where I can go play at one of these schools I can get into academically. I'm never going to put my kids in that position. And it wasn't even my parents. It was really the coaches and the people that I'd respected for so many years. It's really about what's best for the kid. And you can still play soccer for 15 years and be a good athlete and not play college soccer. And it still was a win. It still was a great thing to do. One of the beautiful things about sport is that your level of success is dependent on your level of commitment mm. what you're willing to give to the sport will determine in general how far you can go and how the level that you can reach and the level of commitment that you're willing to give is how far you can go and uh when parents respect that and respect the athlete to make that decision on their own and, and figure out what it is that they want to do with in terms of like how seriously they want to take it while also still trying to guide them in the right direction to, you know, push them a little bit towards, you know, expecting more out of themselves. Like if there's somebody that really enjoys a sport, has some talent, they, they, they do work hard, but like, you know, their parents and their coaches see like, all right, this person could be the real deal, like guiding them in that direction. That's uh very important. And when, when coaches do it, man, it's, it, it's like, and it's always, it's, it's the best coaches do it subtly. They just start planting little seeds like, you know, you could be uh, could be real good. Let's get let's get one extra workout in. Let me let me, let me get 100 extra pushups out of you, please. Mm -hmm. You know, and if it's an athlete that's like not a little 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 baby and they they respond well to it, that uh, that starts to build that that mindset. Yeah, I think also that buying in like try, being a try hard is so not cool anymore. Or at least it wasn't it when be. I was in high school. Like, it should be and I'm cool. the biggest try hard ever. You know, every single thing I do, I'm going to try my ass off. Like, and the company soccer game on the weekend, I'm full out sprint. Like, I'm out here playing soccer. Let's go. Might as well go for it, right? I like I might your as well style. Jamie from accounting, let's go, dude. And <laughs> <laughs> I want to see better touches out of you, Jamie. But, um, and I think that that's part of the reason why my old coach from high school was like, yeah, the kids, they're just not, they don't want to seem like they're trying so hard. Like they're really invested in buying in and being respectful to the coaches. Like it's out of style. Yeah, I'm a try hard. I, I'm, try, I'm trying hard to everything I wanted, everything I do. Uh, you know, it's, I, I think that's the, that's the only way. Why would you not be trying? Totally. You know, what the heck? Go, go hard. <laughs> Expect more out of yourself. People in general nowadays are more lax than uh, in previous days, maybe. And that's unfortunate. Somebody's got to light a fire under some people's asses. <laughs> Let, let's live with a little bit more gusto. Yeah. Turn I the burners on. Totally. And I think it's the complacency stems again from social media mm -hmm. and being able to watch other people's lives. And it takes up so much of your own life that it's easy to get into a routine of being complacent and just going through the motions. Whereas if this is your only life and your only entertainment is your own success, you're going to push yourself much harder. That's facts. <laughs> um, I just, no, I just accidentally ripped my freaking toe spreaders. I just ripped my pinky toes. <laughs> ah, that's unfortunate. Okay. This is a great segue. Let's talk about all of your <laughs> contraptions. So we my have contraptions toe spreaders mastic gum mouth taping can you just walk me through the routine sea salt like okay everything that you use in a day that's a little bit abnormal i chew mastic gum for usually like minimum an hour a day uh i wear my blue for, what is that for okay so that's for building uh your jawline building up your you know chewing more our ancestors used to chew they, they utilize their mouths more and they uh, had stronger jaws, more well-built faces, more developed airways. Okay. So you chew that mastic gum and you're working those jaw muscles, which are malleable. 
you can build up your jawline a little bit. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not like a cure-all. You like you might not get like that stupid jawline. You know, I mean, especially if you're overweight, like if you have excess body fat, like that plays a big factor in what your jawline is going to look like. Mm-hmm. You know, when you lower that body fat, you get you start building up your jawline, especially as a man, your confidence starts to start to soar. Mm-hmm. Of course, of course, we have to we have to mention the breathing aspect of it, like ha- being able to have wider airways and and a face and skull that can have optimal airways is always beneficial because then you're going to breathe better, less restriction, less chance of obstruction. So that's the mastic gum piece of it. The okay. uh, the next one that I, I use is sleep tape. Mm. Shameless plug. Uh, I use Breathe Well Breathe Tape. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say unbiasedly and biasedly, it's the best stuff on the market right now. <laughs> uh, Are we biased because we have an affiliate link? Absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I've, I've had the, actually, I, they were my first like, uh, my first affiliate type thing since uh, starting Bowtie Fighter. That is awesome. Yeah, it was so, it, it happened like so soon into being in the jungle. It happened like less than a month in. I was like, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> uh, so it's pre-cut. Now the thing is with the breathing tape is like, you know, you just need enough to make it so your jaw doesn't open while you're laying down. So a, you don't need to like duct tape your mouth shut or like anything crazy. You can just put a little piece of tape and it will hold your mouth shut and not let your jaw fall open and then not let you breathe through your mouth at night. Cause that's the big piece with the, the breathing tape is not mouth breathing at night. You can do 16 of those hours you're awake and your nose breathing. If you're doing eight hours of mouth breathing in your sleep, well, you're causing some damage, even if you're doing all of that nose breathing during the day. So anywhere we can mitigate mouth, mouth breathing that is not conscious mouth breathing is a great opportunity. Mouth breathing in general, but you know, I say conscious mouth breathing because there are times and places where, you know, especially in, you know, athletics where I'm going to take a, I'm going to have to take a breath through my mouth like, every <laughs> once in a while. Like, sorry, put me in the stockades. Yeah. So breathing tape simple it is stupidly effective when you when you stop mouth breathing at night you snore less and you get deeper sleep which we all need love deeper sleep so what exactly is the problem with mouth breathing for those that are new to the idea <laughs> it's blasphemous we are not designed to be primary mouth breathers you have two ways to take in air you have your nose and you have your mouth they are designed differently structurally for a reason. And uh, your nose is able to, you know, heat the air, filter it, you know, circulate it. Your mouth doesn't have that type of capacity because structurally the back of your throat is just filled with soft tissue that whenever you mouth breathe, you just aggravate that tissue a little bit and aggravate your airways and then make your airways worse. So you don't want to mouth breathe. The mouth is meant to be a backup system. A way to make it so we don't die if we completely lose our nostrils. You know, we still have the capacity to breathe if we bust our nose up. Really, you mouth breathe and then you start having a janked up jawline. Your chin starts to be all sunken. Just your face starts looking all all janky danky. That's no good. Nobody wants that. I have a messed up looking face. You know, where where'd the bow tie fall on? Stop being ugly. Yep, it's important. It's how you uh, move through the world really changes based on your appearance, as bow tie fawns brand would say. With that, thank you so much for coming on. I hope you had as much fun as I did, though it might be difficult. Where can people find your stuff? You can find me on Twitter at Bowtie Fighter. I also have a TikTok with the same handle. Uh, I also have an Instagram with the same handle I just started. You can find me on YouTube, Bowtie Fighter, and on Substack, bowtiefighter.substack.com. Yeah, yeah. bowtiefighter.substack.com. I mostly post free uh, writing on the, the Substacks, but that's where you can find me. I teach breathe, uh, you know, intro breath work to people, which really what I'm teaching you is mindfulness 
and I'm teaching you how to start building that self-awareness uh, because to me, uh, for mindfulness, that's the most important thing is that self-awareness piece. I also uh, teach you about other little dis- disciplinary daily practices in that consult call. Um, and you can book it at bowtiedfighter.gumroad.com. Awesome. Thank you so much again. And thanks to everybody listening. 